Hi everybody, it's Jim from Sprague Woodturning. This week we are doing a birthday bowl. And if you're curious, I make birthday bowls, wedding bowls, uh, retirement bowls, you name it. For whatever occasion there is, I've probably been asked to do it, including a divorce bowl. <laughs> uh, I don't know exactly how you would make a divorce bowl other than maybe cutting it down the middle, but I've been asked that and wondered if I made them. So for this week's project, we're actually going to be using some really nice hard maple burl. So enjoy. All right, so I just took this out of my kiln. As, and as you can see, I've been measuring this by weight to see how much it's lost. And um, so this went in on the 6th of November. Today is the 26th of February. And 1,659 grams. And it came out at 1,627 grams. So it really didn't lose a whole lot of moisture, that was for sure. So, you know, if you don't have a pen meter, uh, this is actually a very reliable way to measure uh, wooden pieces for moisture content. Now on the 10th of February, it was 1628. And you know, 16 days later, we lost one gram of weight. So you know what? I'm gonna call this dry. Now, some of you may have noticed that on the 21st of January, that it actually uh, lost moisture and then uh, it went back up after that and I believe what happened there was I had some pieces that weren't totally dry and I put them in the kiln so that affected the overall moisture content of all the stuff that was in the kiln so that's that's one thing to keep in mind if you are going to use one of these fridge kilns that you know if you if you've got pieces that are drying and then you introduce another piece that's of course got a lot more moisture in it well it may affect um, the rest of them that's inside the kiln. So anyway, here I'm just cleaning up this burl. Uh, you see this, see me do this a number of times. Just using a wire wheel here to get it off all that bark. Uh, it's important that the surface is really clean of bark, that we have good adhesion from the resin. And you know, another way around that is, and I did this with both pieces, but this is this is a sanding mop. I believe it's 120 grit. I actually probably would have preferred something uh, a little more aggressive, say, you know, 80 grit would probably be better. And just go over the entire surface of the burl, and that will give that resin a good solid tooth to bite into, and you shouldn't have any delamination issues. So here I'm just gluing the maple burl pieces in place. I don't want them to move around. So, uh, you know, when you do this method, it's tough to use mold release. You can use it and then clean off that area um, where you're going to glue it. And that usually will work. Um, I do find that a lot of times I'm fitting these pieces in and out of the bucket. So I don't want any of that mold release to get on any of the edges. So that's why I typically forego the, um, the mold release. So this week we're going to be using deep casting epoxy from Designer Epoxy. Uh, this project was about four inches in depth, so you definitely want to use an epoxy that can do that. And deep cast from Designer Epoxy certainly can. And I've, you know, for the record, I've actually poured it a lot thicker than that without issue as well. So you know, uh, there's quite a bit of resin in this project, and you know, thermal cracking certainly can be an issue but you rarely will see that with uh, the deep cast from Designer Epoxy. So this week, uh, we're gonna be using pumpkin orange and I'm gonna really mix this quite intense because uh, the person this is going to, uh, I believe the, the motif in their house has a lot of really um, dark orange pieces in it. So that's, that's why I'm using the uh, pumpkin orange this week. All right, well, that's it. Uh, that is four liters of resin. So this will go into the pressure pot and we'll see you guys in there, 72 hours. Well, all right, it's been 72 hours. Uh, I didn't put any mold release in this, so let's see how this goes. Oh. <sighs> 
looks like we got a pretty good casting. All right, so there's our center, that side. I think I'll just grind this down flat and that way we've got a nice area for the drive center to sit. And let's get this, get this trued up and have a look at it. So here I'm using a pair of dividers to find the center on the other side, that little divot in the bucket certainly will do it um, on the bottom side but you need one on the top and you know I find this to be very effective and you'll see in the next clip when it's mounted on the lathe that it runs pretty darn true. So that was a real-time clip and I like to leave those in there. I'll try and leave as many in those as I can without making these videos overly long. Uh, but here we are, we're using the Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems and you know it really three or four passes and this thing was was trued up so you know uh, that divider method really works well if you've got one of those uh, clear round center finding jigs those will probably work really well too um, but anyway it's a it's a cheap way to do it most turners have large dividers like that so um, give it a try if you're not using that method and there you go that's what the the surface looks like um, Lots of variation in burl. Now these were these are all hard maple burls, but just because they're hard maple burls don't mean they're all going to look the same. That's one of the great things about burl. There's there's a lot of a lot of variation within burls, and there's actually a lot of variations within a single burl. So you know it's hard to get pieces that all match together when it comes to burl. So when I put this in the casting bucket, um, I realized that the downside was going to be the bottom of our bolt uh, this week. Uh, that's why, you know, I put the majority of the wood down in the very bottom. That way you're not, you're not basically turning away resin and you're turning away wood. So I knew that the resin was going to drop in the casting. So I figured that I didn't want to make the top of the casting or bottom because it actually probably would have um, maybe even been smaller. So, you know, I decided to go that in that direction. I think that maybe most people that do castings do do it that way. And then that way you know that the whole bottom part of your, your bowl is going to be a good solid casting. If it's the other way, then it's kind of iffy. With all of that said, the way that I've done this casting today, it will showcase the resin more than the burl. If you had flipped the casting and had, you know, the headstock on the tailstock side, then you're going to have a casting that's going to show more wood than resin. And right, the, the I knew that the color was an important um, part of this, so that's why I showcase the resin instead of the burl. So here we're just going to be taking some nice light cuts, just whittling down, uh, trying to make a basically an outside bowl shape. Uh, I do plan on putting this on a glue block later on and we're going to core this piece as well. So, you know, I it doesn't necessarily need to be its final uh, outside dimension, but you know, as long as we're in the ballpark, I'm good. So you'll see me taking a variety of different cuts here with Hercules. Uh, you know, it is a scraper, but because of the shape of it, it can be used like a gouge as well. You can use push cuts, pull cuts. Um, there are on the corners, it's actually 45 degrees. So if you want to do more of a shearing cut, you can lay it on the edge and then you've got kind of, a, you know, a 45 degree angle um, to work with. 
Uh, you know, a lot of people will just use a round tool and do the same thing. But, you know, Mike Hunter's actually developed this tool to kind of take the guesswork out of it if you're looking for a 45 degree angle. So here's our first real look at it, and you know, right around that scallop edge with that that uh, orange resin, it's going to be. You can tell that it's going to be fantastic. So before we do any coring, uh, I want to make sure that I take the top down to good solid wood and good solid resin. That way, that we can judge the depth of the um, the coring tool before we use it. So just continuing to get down to, to good wood and resin here, uh, you'll see that when, when I shut the lathe off that there's actually going to be a fair bit of resin in the very top part of the bowl. And uh, there you can see it's got quite a bit of it. Uh, it did kind of throw the casting a little out of balance. Uh, I think I was able to run at about 750 most of the time. But that's one, one consideration. It's not really that big of a consideration here because... Burl is a lot denser than normal wood is anyway. But if you had this casting combined with, say, birch, then it probably would have been more out of balance because the birch is a lot lighter in weight. And while we're at it, I figured that I would also turn a tenon on the very top so that you know, if I want to reverse this and put a um, tenon on the bottom, I had that option to do so. Here I'm just showing that I ground off the nub where the live center was sitting. And that way the face of the jaws will rest nicely against the very bottom of the bowl. All right, we're all set up, ready for coring. I've got my Core Pro cutter in, tailstock extender, my number two knife set for my one-way coring system. I'm gonna take out uh, this center piece and I'm gonna save this because I have a plan for it. All right, let's get her done. So that was a real-time clip. Um, believe it or not, the volume there was only at 10%, so it's quite loud uh, when you're coring these uh, burl and resin pieces. So I highly recommend wearing ear protection when you're doing it. Uh, you know, I find I usually don't have to wear any hearing protection when I'm uh, coring green wood, which, of course, this, this uh, coring system is made for green wood. Uh, so, you know, it's just um, she's loud. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, she's loud. And the Core Pro Cutter from Hunter Tool Systems. I mean, it's just doing a fantastic job. I, I'm still amazed at this. I, I know that I brag this product up a lot, but, you know, I'm really, really glad that I've got my hands on these now. Uh, it will make coring so much easier and so much more enjoyable. Uh, you know, before using these, uh, using the old one-way cutters, I found a lot of times, you know, you're, you're always kind of rustling with it. Uh, Either that or you're sharpening it all the time. So, you know, I really think that these are a great option for this for the coring set. So, uh, you know, if you're if you do any amount of coring, I really recommend doing it. And if you do, there is a, a discount code in the description down below. So as you see in there, there wasn't a whole lot of wood holding on to that piece. And, you know, I really don't recommend cutting these pieces off because they could end up flying across the shop. So, you know, uh, ideally, you know, if you've got, say, three quarters of an inch down there to hold that wood in place, that's where I would prefer to see that break off. One of the problems with burl, of course, it doesn't grow. Typically, the grain is kind of all over the place. 
So if you try and break that off, it could go deep into the bowl, the large bowl, which of course is the money bowl, which you don't want to do. So, you know, it's important to cut that down and try and break it off cleanly so that it doesn't pull any wood out of the uh, the large larger bowl. So as you see here, you know, I've got this reversed now back on the outboard of the lathe. And I'll, I'll say this again because a lot of people are confused. I'm left-handed. So I like to work on the outboard end of my lathe on left-hand threads. This is a general uh, 260 variable speed. Uh, it was the Canadian-made model. They're no longer in business. Uh, but, you know, it, it's a... There are better lays on the market, but this has been my daily driver for 10 years. And, you know, it's only let me down once. This is a real-time clip, and you can see I'm taking a shear cut with the Hercules here. The, the handle's tilted a little bit, cutter's at 45 degrees, and it does a real good job cutting that surface nice and clean. So I just cleaned up the rim a little bit. Uh, I don't know if you noticed it on the previous clips, but there was a little bit on one corner there where I, the resin was missing. So I had to take this whittle this down a little bit further in order to try and get that out of there. And that's what I just did there. So here I'm just trying to take some of the mass out of the, the belly of the bowl, the, the curved part of the bowl, if you will. Uh, once I've got that done, then, you know, you can go like from the rim down into the base of the bowl. Uh, it just depends on how you prefer to turn. That's once I get an even wall thickness, that's that's kind of the way that I like to do it. But, you know, I'm not totally married to the idea, that idea. I certainly try different things with, with different castings. And you may find that as well. Uh, different woods behave differently when you cut them. Uh, this stuff here, it's... I swear it's as hard as concrete. It really is. Uh, that burl, and I'm, I'm referring to the burl, uh, hard maple burl is not typically a joy to turn. Uh, it gives you some pretty spectacular looking pieces of wood, but you definitely work for uh, that, that look, that's for sure. So, you know, again, I'm just thinning this out, and you'll see maybe I'll start taking longer sweeping cuts as I now know that I've got an even wall thickness throughout the piece. And again, always checking. So if you guys have made it along this far, well, I really appreciate uh, you watching. Uh, you know, my analytics tell me that Usually by this point, I lose a number of people. I do realize that some of the stuff I make is repetitive. Uh, but, you know, uh, I really appreciate the people sticking around and watching my videos and, of course, putting up with the ads. I mean, that's that's the only way that most YouTubers can afford to be here is if, uh, if you guys watch the ads. So, you know, uh, again, thank you so much for doing that. And thank you so much for your patience. So this is a real-time clip. Um, that it's it's funny when I when I'm turning, I typically don't think that I'm going that slow, but then when I watch the footage, I go, yeah, well, I guess I was. So you know, it's very very similar to a gouge in this regard. You can see that I'm cutting above center, and I'm gonna dip the tool and come right down into the center point just like I would with my Ellsworth gouge. Um, this is what I was saying earlier, that a lot of times uh, I find the Hercules is very similar to a gouge, uh, except for the scraping uh, motions that you get when the tools pre present it straight onto the wood. Just the last few little, I like to call this reverse shear cuts because I'm pulling out of the wood instead of pushing into it. And there, you can see the surface is cut pretty darn clean. Just need it to clean up the rim a little bit and we are ready for sanding.
like I typically do, I start at 60 grit. Uh, now that the bowl is thinned out a bit, I was able to get 1,000 RPM. My drill uh, is at 2,400 RPM, and that's typically the way that I like the sand. Ideally, I would be doing 1,200 with the bowl. Uh, wasn't able to do it with this due to vibration. And this is another real-time clip. This shows you how fast I move the, the drill in and out of the piece as I sand it. Uh, again, this is another thing that's very hard for people to pick up on uh, when the, the footage is sped up. So this is for the people that are maybe having issues with their sanding. That's typically the speed I go. And I never really sit in the very base of the bowl very long. You'll see me typically go past it like I am there. That way you don't get a divot. And there you go, after 60 grit, especially with that hard burl, it is perfect and ready to move on to 80. There were a couple of spots that needed to be fixed, so here we're going to use the Star Bond Thin. No need to color it, uh, just a couple little spots, and of course, setting it with the accelerator. I think I had to do this two or three times in order to fill the void to where we needed it to be. And uh, there you go, I didn't see any other spots. So before I carry on sanding, I grind that back. And then once it's ground back to the surface of the wood, I turn the lathe on and blend it all in. So after that area was fixed, I carried on sanding to 800 like I typically do with these resin and wood castings. Brown Triple E buffing compound from the Be All Buffing System. Uh, again, you know, if you're not using this method, I strongly recommend you give it a try. It does a fantastic job taking those fine scratches out of the resin. You can see it actually on the left side, how it just puts a nice shine on it and it actually works very, very well. And then of course, cleaning up with denatured alcohol before the first coat of finish goes on. Well, all right, this is Waterlux, original VOC. First coat, the best part. Look at that. That's awesome. That resin there is just looks like it's on fire. It's very, very cool. Very bottom of the piece. You guys haven't really seen this much in this video. Not like this anyway. Beautiful burl. Awesome. Well, that's it for me today. See you guys tomorrow. So the next day, again, with the brown Triple E, buff the surface back, take out any little bits of whatever that was in the finish, and get it ready for the next coat. Same thing, denatured alcohol, uh, and you'll see here in a minute, I'll clean this piece, and I'll show you what the, what the rag looks like. And, and of course, that's that residue, that'll be left behind on the surface of the bowl if you don't take it off. Well, good morning. This is the second coat of Waterlux. I don't typically talk about this too much, but when you put on your second and third coat, once the wood has been sealed, you got to be really careful how much you put on there because you can get runs and sags uh, in your project. So uh, the second and third coats, certainly less is more. All right, I think it's going to take three coats. I don't think the two is going to do it. Uh, crazy flaming action there. That's just spectacular. Absolutely love that. Same thing there. I mean, it literally looks like it could be on fire. Very, very cool. All right, I'm gonna do the third coat the same as this one. 
Wow. And we'll see you when we're doing the foot at the end. Well, as you can see, we got more snow last night. Sure is pretty stuff. As long as you don't get a shovel it. <laughs> but over here on the lathe, well, here's another beauty. <laughs> so, anyway, I just thought I'd throw a couple of little clips in there, moving snow. Uh, I haven't had to do a whole lot of it this year. We've actually, it's been a fairly mild winter, and um, it's good. Anyway, I did shoot uh, an entire video. I wouldn't put it up for Friday content, but, you know, uh, maybe I'll put it up through the week. Uh, just kind of just kind of bonus material if you want. So let me know if you want to see that kind of stuff. So after parting this piece, uh, I usually typically leave about an inch. Uh, it's important not to force anything here because if you do, you can crack the resin at the bottom of the uh, the bowl, which would not be cool at this point. So, you know, just go easy with it and then eventually it will give up and uh, you'll see here actually how much material was left behind. So here are the pieces being held to the lathe with my vacuum chuck. So, you know, again, just taking very light cuts. And I know that it's typically hard to see, but the very center of the bowl is dished in from the outer part of the foot so that when the bowl is sitting on the table if there's you know some salt sitting on the table or whatever it's not going to rock on the table so you know i i know a lot of times that's lost in because you don't really see it but it is always concave a bit and i did sand this piece from 180 to 800 on the very bottom Happy birthday, Carolyn. This bowl's for you. Now, before we talk about this week's project, I thought I'd give you an update on the Banksia pod vase. Man, I took a lurch in the comments <laughs> last week. Banksia. Banksia. Uh, anyway, I just used my finger like you see here. Uh, redid the finish. You know, I wasn't able to get it perfect, but, you know, using the Fast Cure uh, resin is a little finicky, but it did get the job done. All right, let's have a last little look at this beautiful bowl. Now in my very limited resin slash pigment mixing career, I have found that the more stronger you mix these pearl pigments, the more likelihood you're going to have that flaming that you see right there. So, you know, if you're going for that look, you got to mix, mix your pig pigments pretty strong. And again, you know, the burl itself, all three of them being hard maple burls, all different in appearance, really. Beautiful piece. Happy belated birthday, Carolyn Jean Bowers. And of course, her son-in-law, Laz, commissioned this piece for her. Uh, I didn't get it to her before her birthday. Uh, just didn't work out. <laughs> so anyway, I'm sorry about that. Uh, here's the very bottom. I've covered up her date of birth, uh, not only so that, you know, the world doesn't know how old she is, but uh, for identity theft too, that can be an issue. But anyway, let me know in the comments what you think about this week's project. I'm in love with this bowl. I think it's gorgeous. I really do. Uh, and again, of course, that thumbs up will help the analytics. So if you can give that a thumb, give my videos a thumbs up and share with your friends, that would be awesome as well. And don't forget about our sponsors in the description down below. If you need any stuff, please head on down there, get your discount codes, and put some money back in your pocket. All right, well, that's it. Uh, next week, next week we're going to visit the Amazon. I'll leave it at that. Till then, 
Take care, stay safe. Don't forget that bell, and we'll see you next week.